Hello everyone, my name is Ian Yauslin, I'm a professor in mathematical physics at Rutgers University, and in this video I'll be talking about how the winners of the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics have proved that the world is not local. That means that, at least in principle, it is possible for me to take an action in this very room and for that action to have effects arbitrarily far away, even as far away as the other side of the universe. Now the way that the 2022 Nobel Prize winners prove that this is in fact the case is by proving that a certain inequality, called Bell's inequality, is violated in nature. What I'll talk about today in the video is how the violation of Bell's inequality translates to a non-local world. So let me start by talking a little bit about the concept of locality, and I'll do that in an example. In our example, we'll consider two scientists, Alice and Blurb, and each scientist has an object that they can do experiments on. In the case of this example, this object will be an electron. So Alice has an electron, and Blurb has an electron. Now what's important from the point of view of locality is that Alice and Blurb may be as far away as possible from each other. So for the sake of this example, let's assume that Alice is on Earth, whereas Blurb is on a distant planet called Omicron Persei 8. Now what the principle of locality implies in this case is that if Alice does something to her electron, then there cannot be an instantaneous effect on Blurb's electron all the way on Omicron Persei 8. In fact, to say it a little more precisely, if Alice does something to her electron, the time that we would have to wait in order for an effect to, be, uh, to propagate to Blurb's electron has to be at least the amount of time that it would take for a beam of light to travel from Earth to Omicron Persei 8. Now, light travels at a finite speed, so the amount of time that that will take will be a certain uh, finite positive amount of time. So that's uh, the implication of the principle of locality for this example. And from this point of view, locality seems like a very reasonable assumption to make. Actually, more than just a reasonable assumption, it seems rather important, even from the point of view of defining science and the scientific method itself. Because in science, we try to do experiments in such a way that there are no outside perturbations to the experiment that will affect the outcomes. Right? So imagine for a second that there were no form of locality at all. And let's imagine that in this situation, whenever someone on Omicron Persei 8 sneezes, that changes the outcomes of all of the experiments that we do on Earth. Well, this would be a rather significant problem. It would make it impossible for us to make an experiment on Earth reproducibly, and it would certainly make it impossible for us to predict the outcomes of experiments on Earth, because we cannot know if the people on Omicron Persei 8 are sneezing or not, because that's way too far for us to go and check. So the principle of locality is not only a very reasonable assumption to make, but it seems like one that is actually important to define such basic things as the scientific method. Now, as we're going to see today in this video, the world is actually not local. It violates this principle of locality. However, it does so in a way that does not undermine the scientific method. In other words, it does so in a way that we can still do reproducible experiments and predict the outcomes of experiments on Earth without knowing what's happening on Omicron Persei 8. I'll say a little bit more about that towards the end of the video. So we've talked a little bit about the concept of locality, at least within the example that I just talked about. What I'd like to talk about next is the Einstein-Podolsky-Rosen paradox, which is due to Albert Einstein, Boris Podolsky, and Nathan Rosen, and was published in 1935. Now, throughout this video, I'm going to be abbreviating Einstein-Podolsky-Rosen to EPR, which is a rather standard thing to do. And in fact, what I'll be presenting here is a slightly modified version of the EPR paradox that's due to David Bohm, although the core concepts of what I'll be talking about are in the original paper by uh, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. Now, in order to define the EPR paradox for uh, this particular setup, I need to introduce three ingredients from the theory of quantum mechanics. The first one is that electrons have a property that is called spin. So recall that in our setup, Alice and Blurb are interacting with an electron. 
Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to assume that the way that they interact with their electrons is by measuring the spin of their electron. Now, according to quantum mechanics, when an electron spin is measured, it can yield two possible values, either plus one or minus one. So that means that when Alice measures the spin of her electron, she will either measure plus one or she will measure minus one. And it's the same thing with, with Blurb's electron. Now, the second ingredient from the theory of quantum mechanics that we need is that the values for the spin of the electron does not actually exist before the measurement is done. That means that before Alice measures the spin of her electron, there isn't a pre-existing value for the spin of that electron. Now, this sounds a little crazy, but it's actually not that bad. I can reformulate it by saying that, it's, that if one wants to measure the spin of an electron, then one has to affect the state of that electron. And so the spin of the electron doesn't exist uh, independently of the measurement because the measurement itself can affect the electron. Right? So that's really what, what it means when I say that there are no pre-existing values for, uh, for the spin of an electron. Now the third ingredient that we need is the existence of an entangled state. What that means in this context is that it is possible, according to the laws of quantum mechanics, to take Alice's electron and Blurb's electron and manipulate them together. Uh, so here they're in a state where they're, they're close to each other. So I manipulate them and put them in what is called an entangled state. And in this entangled state, um, the, so the, the entangled state that I'm considering here is such that if I take one of these electrons and give it back to Alice, and I take the other electron and give it back to Blurb, then when Alice measures the spin of her electron, whatever she measures is going to be the opposite of what Blurb measures. So when Alice measures the spin of her electron, she'll, if she'll either, either measure plus one or minus one. If she measures plus one, then necessarily when Blurb measures his electron, he'll measure minus one. Right? And if Alice measures minus one, then necessarily Blurb's measurement will yield the value plus one. In other words, there's a perfect anti-correlation between the outcome of the measurements of the spins of the electrons. They are always opposite from each other. So this is what the theory of quantum mechanics predicts. However, when I present things in this way, there seems like there's something non-local going on. Because let's look at this from the point of view of Blurb's electron. Before Alice measures her, the, the spin of her electron, then Blurb's electron is in a state in which a spin measurement will either give minus one or plus one, but both of them are a possibility. But now immediately after Alice has measured her spin, let's say that she's measured plus one, then Blurb's electron immediately changes into a state in which the measurement of the spin will necessarily yield minus one. So that means that from the point of view of Blurb's electron, uh, Blurb's electron has gone from a state in which plus and minus one were both possibilities for the measurement of the spin, to a state in which only minus one is a possibility. And uh, EPR have argued, so they, uh, their argument is essentially that the only way that this can be true without violating the principle of locality is if the spins of the electrons actually had values before they were measured. So in other words, uh, the EPR argument says that uh, if locality is to be true, then this uh, idea from quantum mechanics must not hold true, and there must exist pre-existing values for uh, the spins of the electron. Now, why does this uh, solve the, 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 the problem of locality? So in order to discuss this, let me give up a little bit on the quantum world, and let's discuss a similar situation in the classical world and see how pre-existing values can allow something that looks like the non-local effect that we talked about earlier, and yet, uh, there, and yet in this example, there is no non-local effect. So let's replace our quantum electrons with classical particles, which in this case are going to be two billiard balls. Now these billiard balls, they have markings on them. One of the billiard balls has a marking that says plus one, and the other billiard ball has a marking that says minus one. Now, let's imagine that we hide 
these markings, but the markings exist. So we hide them, and we mix up the billiard ball so that we don't know which one is which. And then we give one of the balls to Alice, and we give the other ball to Blurb. Right? Now, um, okay. now, from the point of view of Blurb's billiard ball, before uh, looking at the billiard ball, it's in a situation in which it could either, either have a plus one marking or the minus one marking, and it will be so with a 50-50 probability. But now, what if Alice is actually observes the, uh, the marking on her billiard ball, and let's say, uh, for the sake of example, that she observes that she has the plus one billiard ball. Then immediately, instantaneously, Blurb's ball is, is now in a state in which necessarily it has the minus one marking on it. So before the observation, uh, the ball was in a state where it was either plus one or minus one with a 50-50 probability. After, the, after Alice's observation, and when I mean after, I mean immediately after, uh, Blurb's ball turns into a state where it necessarily is the minus one ball with a 100% probability. However, what I just said now is not mysterious in any way. The balls, we didn't know which one was which, but one of them was actually the plus one ball, and the other one was actually the minus one ball. So we managed to have this change of state uh, that may seem non-local, but there's nothing non-local happening. It's just that each billiard ball had a pre-existing value for the marking on the ball. Now, if I apply this reasoning back to our quantum electrons, what that means is that if uh, we are to keep the notion of locality, then necessarily the spins of the electrons had to have pre-existing values um, before the experiment was done. So, to summarize, the EPR argument says that locality in quantum mechanics implies pre-existing values for electron spin. Now, to be fair, this is not actually how EPR, uh, how EPR put it in their original paper. Uh, they had no intention to revisit the, the assumption of locality, but merely said that, well, naturally, quantum mechanics must be local, and therefore there must be pre-existing values for spin. However, it's interesting to see uh, the EPR argument in this light that locality implies pre-existing values for spin, and that's in fact what scientist John Bell did uh, and published a paper about it in 1964. In this paper, um, John Bell wanted to see if one could save the notion of, quant of locality in quantum mechanics by introducing pre-existing values for spin. However, in this paper, Bell proved a theorem that uh, if there are pre-existing values for electron spin, then necessarily some statistical inequality must hold true. Now, I've written this statistical inequality here. The details of this don't really matter. The important point I'm making here is that if there are pre-existing values for spin, then some inequality has to hold true. And this inequality has since come to be called Bell's inequality. However, later on in this paper, Bell found that there are certain situations in quantum mechanics in which Bell's inequality is not true. Now, if the right-hand side of an implication does not hold, that means that necessarily the left-hand side of the implication must not hold. So necessarily, there are no pre-existing values for spin. Why is that? Well, if there were pre-existing values for spin, then the inequality would hold. So there are no pre-existing values for spin. And so following the same logic, this means that necessarily quantum mechanics is not local. Right? So in this 1964 paper, Bell proved that quantum mechanics is necessarily not local. Now the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to uh, three, three physicists, Alain Aspe, John Clauser, and Anton Seilinger, who, along with their collaborators, did experiments that showed that Bell's inequality is violated, so it does not hold, in nature. Right? Independently of whether quantum mechanics is a correct theory or not, Bell's inequality does not hold true in nature. And that means that nature itself is not local. 
So what this means is that after the experiments done by uh, the Nobel Prize winners, from a scientific point of view, we just have to accept the fact that locality is not present in nature. So the world is not local. However, it's not local in a very special way. The way that we exhibited non-locality here was by considering a, a situation in which we had two electrons that, you may recall, were in this special entangled state. Now, to create this entangled state, it was necessary to take Alison Blurb's electron and to manipulate them together to form this entangled state. So, whereas it is true that Alison Blurb's electrons are interacting with each other in a non-local way, they have a common history. They were, at some point in the past, brought together and put in this special state. And in fact, uh, entanglement, which is the, the property that we use in order to have non-locality, entanglement is, in practice, extremely short-lived. In fact, there are scientists who, uh, who are trying to uh, produce entanglement between quantum particles and make that entanglement last for as long as possible, and at the very, very best, they can keep entanglement alive for a matter of minutes. In practice, for most systems, uh, entanglement can only be kept alive for a matter of microseconds. So that's, that is extremely short-lived. This is why this non-locality does not undermine the scientific method. If I'm doing an experiment here on Earth, I don't need to know what's going on in Omicron per CI8, because in order to have the kind of non-locality that I, I was talking about here, there would have to be a pair of particles on Earth and on Omicron per CI8 that have this property called entanglement, which means that they have to have been together at some point in the past, but uh, the time that it would take uh, to separate these particles and move one to the Earth and one to Omicron per CI8 is so long that the entanglement between these particles will have disappeared by that time. And therefore, um, even though the world is not local in this way, the scientific method is still alive and kicking. So to summarize, using the EPR argument, Bell proved that quantum mechanics is necessarily not local. And the winners of the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics show that indeed nature is not local. So from a scientific point of view, we just have to resign ourselves to the idea that the world is not local, and that's just that. Thank you all for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, I'm planning on, on making more like this about various topics in mathematics and physics, maybe every two months or so. So I hope to see you there. Thank you.